Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 2014 Winter Commencement Ceremony of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Evan Adair, a senior Romance Languages and Vocal Performance major, will lead us in singing our national anthem.
Please be seated. Two hundred and twenty years ago this month, on December eleventh, seventeen eighty nine, the North Carolina General Assembly passed a bill that established what would become the nation's first public university to open its doors, the University of North Carolina. The founders believed that education was the most profound way to guarantee the liberty and the well-being of their newly formed nation. And while our nation's beliefs about the guarantees of freedom and how far they extend have been greatly expanded since then, and will continue to expand, that idea with its simple elegance, lux a libertas, rings as true today as ever. Several more years would pass before the trustees selected a location for this dream, this beautiful place, and the operations began. It was nine years later in 1798 that seven graduates received their diplomas from Carolina, and that day, began the tradition that we celebrate on this beautiful day more than 200 years later. Over the centuries, Carolina has continued to change. It has faced both the struggles and the promise of our nation with the support, the love, the spirit of generations of North Carolinians and graduates from across the world. In turn, Carolina has provided a life-changing experience for students from all backgrounds, from poverty to privilege, and it's provided a place for our faculty to make game-changing discoveries and open for generations of students new worlds of knowledge and possibility. Of course, this moment, as wonderful as it feels for our graduates today, is really just the start. Countless Carolina graduates have stood in your shoes, and they've used their opportunities and the privilege that's that have been given to them, not to, stat to settle for the status quo, but to push for advances across the spectrum of human endeavor. One such example is Dr. Francis Collins, who received his PhD, I mean, excuse me, his MD in North Carolina in 1977. He's now the director of the National Institutes of Health. He, in his commencement speech at Carolina a few years back, he said, the purpose of a life is a life of purpose. You have responsibilities from your education to this university to give back something to the state, to the nation, and to the world. I know that I believe, I know your faculty believes, I think your friends and your family who have been with you all the way believe that you are going to do that. We see in you, and in fact, more than that, we depend upon you to be not only the fresh face, but also the principled and the resolute face of our future. Today, we're celebrating your success, your hard work, 
but even more, we are celebrating that future. And we are recognizing this afternoon the work and determination of 2,182 students who received their degrees last August or who will receive those degrees today. That's 997 amazing undergraduates, 790 hardworking master's students, 41 incredible professional students, and 354 game-changing doctoral students. Your discoveries and your passions in all of our fields are going to shape the, the future of our nation for decades to come. And in just a few moments, you're going to hear from our commencement speaker, Professor Jim Johnson, much more about the evolving, the vibrant world you will be helping to shape. As I said earlier, Carolina, we often call it the University of the People, is dedicated to Luxe Libertas and to preserving those rights for future generations. And it makes me especially proud today to recognize amongst our graduates, military veteran and active duty personnel, including brand new ensigns and second lieutenants in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. I'd like to ask all active duty and veterans here today, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. We are also celebrating our own Carolina Firsts, graduates who are the first in their families to attend university. And we applaud the incredible bridges that you are building to help pave the way for so many others. Can we ask everyone to join me in thanking all of our Carolina Firsts? It's now my privilege to introduce my distinguished colleagues on the platform today. They, as I said, believe like I do in your promise and your potential to change the world. I will call their names and I'll ask them to stand and remain standing, but I ask you to please hold your applause until I've recognized everyone. James Dean, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost. As the Chief Academic Officer, Provost Dean oversees the 14 schools of the university and the university library. Winston Crisp, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. Vice Chancellor Crisp is responsible for much of the rest of the student life, including residence halls, health and wellness, leadership, and service. Bruce Cairns, Chair of the Faculty. Dr. Cairns is the John Stackhouse Distinguished Professor of Surgery and the Director of the internationally renowned North Carolina J.C. Burns Center. Carolina has a very proud tradition of shared governance that dates back to its beginning. Joseph Farrell, Research Professor of Public Law and Secretary to the Faculty. The Office of Secretary to the Faculty dates back to the university's founding and is also an important part of faculty governance. Shelby Dawkins Law, President of the Graduate and Professional Students Federation. Ms. Dawkins Law is a doctoral student in policy, leadership, and school improvement in the School of Education. It's also my pleasure to recognize Professor and Department Chair of Chemistry, Valerie Ashby, who is the faculty marshal. Thank you all for taking part in this ceremony today. Now please join me in welcoming President Tom Ross, President of the University of North Carolina, who will bring greetings to our new graduates on behalf of the university system. Good afternoon. Chancellor Folt, Mr. McMahon, members of the Board of Trustees, Dr. Johnson, distinguished guests, and most importantly, members of the class of 2014. On behalf of the entire University of North Carolina, 
I welcome each and every one of you to this special event. As an alumnus of the UNC School of Law, it is a special privilege for me to take part in this commencement ceremony as president of our great university. Let me also join Chancellor Folt in offering special greetings to the families, parents, grandparents, and siblings, and to the close friends of this great group of students seated before me, as well as to the faculty, students, staff, and alumni who have joined us here today. Again, I extend special warm greetings to each of you in the class of 2014. We are here today to pay tribute to you and to your achievements. So on behalf of the entire University of North Carolina, let me congratulate each and every one of you. All of us are extremely proud of you because of the excellent teaching by our outstanding faculty and your own committed efforts. You have acquired the knowledge, competencies, and skills that will serve you well the rest of your lives. Your minds are sharp and filled with ideas. You can write, speak, and think with the best of them. You're prepared to engage globally and locally and are truly ready to tackle all of the many adventures, opportunities, and challenges life will bring to you. I am hopeful and confident that each of you will be successful. Some of you as doctors or lawyers, some as entrepreneurs, some working in nonprofits, some as CEOs, some making life-changing or life-saving discoveries. I'm equally hopeful and confident that each of you will strive to make life better for others, that you will work to improve the community in which you live, and that you will do all you can to contribute to the common good and a better world. My desire is that each of you live your life going forward in a manner that matters, that makes a positive difference. So I urge you to go forth to do well and to do good. I close by again extending my best wishes and heartfelt congratulations to each of you graduates on this, your big day. And I thank you for allowing me to be with you. Thank you, President Ross. I'm now very pleased to introduce Mr. Ed McMahon, a member of the UNC Board of Governors. Mr. McMahon graduated from Carolina in 1966 with a degree in industrial relations. He's a retired businessman and a former member of the North Carolina General Assembly from Charlotte. He will bring greetings on behalf of the Board of Governors. Good afternoon. Boy, isn't Carolina blue the most beautiful color in the world? It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> President Ross, Chairman Codell, Chancellor Folt, Provost Dean, distinguished Professor Johnson, distinguished guests, graduates, and friends, it is my honor today to bring greetings from the members of the University of North Carolina Board of Governors. As a native North Carolinian, I love North Carolina, especially its 17 campus system. I must admit, I take special pride, though, in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am proud to be a Carolina graduate where I received a world-class education. Graduation is a time to recognize an ending, the completion of your degree, and a time to celebrate a beginning the commence, commencing of a new chapter in your life. You deserve to celebrate, but it is also important to acknowledge the contributions of the faculty and the staff of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and to express appreciation for the support of your parents and family. I am certain you agree how vital their encouragement has been. Today, you are graduating from the first public university founded in the United States. UNC Chapel Hill was created for us and for those who come after us at a great sacrifice. It was created because a state of poor farmers had the vision to know that access to a public higher education was the key to greatness for
for this state and its people. Graduates, this university has been the key to our success as a state and as a people. The experiences learned during your time at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill will resonate throughout your entire life. Graduates, no matter where you go or what you do from here, you are future leaders. You have many advantages, not least of which is the old well network of Carolina alumni, faculty, staff, fellow students, and graduates. You are now ambassadors of this great institution, and the University of North Carolina salutes your hard work, applauds your accomplishments, and looks forward to your contributions to our university, our state, and our nation. May this special moment live always in your hearts. We hope you will stay connected to this wonderful university. Congratulations and happy holidays to all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMahon. I'm now pleased to introduce the chair of the Board of Trustees of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Lowry, Lowry Cottle. Dr. Cottle graduated from Carolina with a chemistry degree in 1979. He's an investor and entrepreneur who also has an adjunct appointment in the Department of Chemistry and is very active with our, our entrepreneur program. Dr. Cottle will bring greetings today from the Board of Trustees. Graduates, congratulations on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As trustees, our job is to help make sure that Carolina students have the very best opportunities, everything that a great global public research university offers to help you learn, make discoveries, and apply your knowledge for the public good. As students and now graduates, we want you to be prepared to see a need and think does it have to be this way? We want you to have the tools to explore, discover, and implement. To start with a question, gather information, engage partners, persevere to reach a goal, and then implement new ideas and solutions. That's what we mean when we talk about being innovative and entrepreneurial. You can change the world. That's what we're doing at Carolina, and that's what you've been part of in your time here. UNC's founders believed that an educated person is a public asset, and the people of North Carolina and our supporters still believe in this public benefit. That is why your Carolina education has included engagement and public service. I urge you to continue to do that after you leave Carolina and to prove our founders were right. Congratulations on your achievements and best wishes for your future success. Thank you, Dr. Cottle. I'm now pleased to introduce the chair of the Board of Directors of the General Alumni Association, Mr. Vaughn Bryson, who will bring greetings on behalf of Carolina's more than 300,000 living alumni. Mr. Bryson, UNC class of 1960, is the former president and CEO of Eli Lilly. Thank you, Chancellor. And let me also join the others in congratulating all of you for this tremendous accomplishment. I was also a native North Carolinian and was a Carolina first, although back in the dark ages when I graduated, we didn't make that distinction. Um, but for all of you, after years of hard work, I'm sure countless anxious moments and late nights, you have earned your degree from Carolina. You and your family can be justifi justifiably proud of your sacrifices and your accomplishments. Now you join the largest and only permanent part of our Carolina family. As Chancellor Folt has stated, you are now among more than 300,000 Carolina alumni living in each of North Carolina's 100 counties, every one of our 50 states, and over, four, over 140 nations. The General Alumni Association is the official organization for all former Carolina students. The GAA will keep you informed about and connected to your university, your classmates, and Tar Heel friends, 
local Carolina club events, and other alumni activities through our bi-monthly issues of the Carolina Alumni Review. As our newest alumni, you may be particularly interested in our alumni career services programs and opportunities to network. However, whenever you may move and when you move, please keep the GAA informed of your new address. And again, congratulations for a job well done. Thank you, Mr. Bryson. It is a tradition at Carolina to invite an outstanding member of our faculty to speak at the mid-year commencement. Senior class president, Sasha Seymour, will introduce our speaker today. Sasha is a double major in economics and global studies from New Bern, North Carolina. He is a member of the men's basketball team and was just awarded a prestigious George J. Mitchell scholarship to pursue graduate studies in Northern Ireland. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sasha Seymour. Hello, UNC class of 2014 December graduates. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. James H. Johnson, Jr. Dr. Johnson is the William R. Keenan Distinguished Professor of Strategy and Entrepreneurship at the Keenan Flagler Business School and Director of the Urban Investment Strategy Center and the Frank Hawkins Keenan Institute of Private Enterprise. Johnson is a Senior Research Fellow at the Carolina Population Center and an Adjunct Professor of Public Policy, Sociology, and Geography. Economic and Employment Impact of White Collar jo Job Shifts Offshore on U.S. Competitiveness. He has published more than 100 scholarly articles and three research monographs, as well as co-authored several books. His research interests include community and economic development, the effects of demographic changes on the U.S. workplace, interethnic minority conflict in advanced industrial societies, urban poverty and public policy in urban America, and workforce diversity issues. In addition to all of that, he is a founding member and chairs the board for the Global Scholars Academy, a year-round kindergarten through eighth grade school aimed at providing smaller class sizes and Thank you, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Sasha, for that most kind introduction. UNC System President Tom Ross, Mr. McMahon representing the UNC Board of Governors, Chancellor Folt, members of the UNC Chapel Hill Executive Leadership Team and Board of Trustees, faculty and staff colleagues, Carolina alums, candidates for graduation, and family and friends of the soon-to-be graduates, it is a high honor for me to stand here as your speaker this afternoon. After more than 30 years as a professor in higher education, I must confess that I still get goosebumps whenever I hear the music and observe the pomp and circumstance that surrounds graduation ceremonies. Having been selected as your speaker by Chancellor Folk based on the recommendation of a committee comprised of faculty, colleagues, and students, I should note that my goosebumps are a tad bit larger on this grand occasion. Let me begin by congratulating each of you, the members of the 2014 graduating class, on reaching the important milestones in your lives for which you are being acknowledged, honored, and celebrated today. I am both incredibly proud of you individually and collectively and in awe of your outstanding achievements. My message to you this today is anchored primarily in research I have conducted over the past decade or so on the profound economic and demographic transformations we are currently experiencing as a state, as a nation, and as a global community. Research suggests that we are entering a new phase in the historic evolution of our increasingly global economic system. In the words of Jeffrey Jarris, Chairman, CEO, and President of the Manpower Group, the Global Labor Recruitment Behemoth, we are entering what is called the human age, where inner human potential will be the primary driver of innovations in our economy and of all major advances in our lives. Against this backdrop, I respectfully ask your indulgence as I speak for the next few minutes on the subject, thriving and prospering in the human age. 
Following brief comments about the current state of our economy and the distinguishing features of the human age, I will highlight the essential skills I believe you must have in your toolkits to be successful in the years ahead, irrespective of whether you plan to pursue additional education, enter the new world of work, or hang out a shingle as an entrepreneur or small business owner. The key takeaway of my message to you this afternoon is this. As soon to be graduates of Carolina, all of you, I am convinced, are equipped with the requisite tools to excel in the new world of work. More than a decade ago, and in, in anticipation of our impending societal transition to the human age, Carolina rebranded itself as the Innovation University, a place where intellectual entrepreneurship is not only encouraged but also celebrated and modified the academic cur curriculum accordingly to ensure that you would be able to acquire the requisite skills to successfully pursue whatever career path you decided to take after completing your studies. Now that your graduation day is here, I have two simple objectives this afternoon. First, to remind you of the enormous competitive advantages you have as 2014 graduates of this university, and second, to give you a few tips about how to market yourself in the hyper-competitive global economy of the 21st century. Allow me to set the stage for my remarks about the distinguishing features of the human age with a few observations about the present state of our economy. As many of you contemplate either entering or moving up in the labor market, the good news is that our economy is on the mend. We are slowly but surely rebounding from the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Between 2007 and 2009, we lost 8.7 million jobs in this country, and our unemployment rate skyrocketed to 10% in 2009, up from 5% prior to the onset of the Great Recession in 2007. To work our way out of the economic malaise, economists told us in 2012 we needed to create 208,000 jobs every month over the next eight years to return to pre-recession employment levels. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, our economy has created on an average of about 222,000 jobs each month over the past 12 months. And this past month, November 2014, the U.S. economy generated 321,000 jobs. Our current unemployment rate is 5.8%, a six-year low, and a rate characterized by some economists as the new normal in the highly volatile global economy. Companies are laying off and firing fewer workers. The quit rate in firms is on the rise, a sign of growing confidence on the part of workers that job growth is sufficiently robust that they will be able to find another and perhaps better job if they quit the one that they currently have. And perhaps the strongest indicator of a sustained economic recovery, the 2014, uh, November 2014 employment situation report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics revealed a sharp jump in hourly earnings for ordinary workers. But the world of work is changing dramatically as we rebound from the Great Recession of 2007-2009. In fact, across the last three recessions, long-term joblessness, those unemployed for six months or longer, increased more rapidly among people with some college, a bachelor's degree or higher than it did among people with a high school diploma or less. The incidence of poverty also increased more rapidly among the better educated than the less well-educated during the most recent recession. At the same time, employers have constantly complained about the inability to find skilled workers to fill critical positions in their firms. In fact, according to surveys conducted by Deloitte Consulting and the Economist Magazine Intelligence Unit, global companies continue to anticipate a major shortage of the types of workers they will need to propel growth and expansion in the years ahead. How is it that business leaders and HR professionals continue to anticipate such a shortage of workers when according to the BLS, thousands of college graduates under age 25 are either unemployed or underemployed. A wide range of explanations have been offered for this seeming paradox. One of the explanations, the one that resonates most strongly with me, posits that we are on the cusp of the next great transformation in the world economy. One that requires that you possess, above and beyond a college degree, a specific set of human capital assets and technical skills in order to be either attractive as a potential employee or successful as an entrepreneur in the human age. So what are the characteristics of the human age and what specific skills are required to succeed in it? To again quote the leader of the Manpower Group, the firm that specializes in global labor recruitment, we are entering a new reality in which human potential itself will become the major agent of economic growth. 
distinguishes this new reality from earlier epochs in our economic history, Jarrett states that, and I quote, in the past, human ingen ingenuity, endeavor, and innovation led to a new technology or way of organizing the world that transformed it. Previous eras were defined first by the raw materials our ancestors bent to their will, stone, iron, and bronze. Then they were characterized by the domains people conquered with ever-improving technology, industry, space, and information. Now it will be human potential itself that will be the catalyst for change and the global driving force economically, politically, and socially. He goes on to note that in this new reality, humans are rising to the challenge to take their rightful place at center stage as the world's only source of inspiration and innovation. One of the lessons that the Great Recession taught corporate leaders is that having the right people in the right place at the right time is a key to their competitiveness in an economy where unpredictable and unbridled change is the only constant. In the business community, the prevailing belief today is that the only way to adapt, evolve, and rebuild following the Great Recession will be through the determination of the human spirit. To weather uncertainty, employers and HR professionals assert that we will have to attract retain and unleash this inner human potential of the right people to succeed in the human age. As soon to be 2014 graduates of Carolina, I firmly believe all of you are the right people. But how do you unleash and leverage your vast human potential in an increasingly volatile and unpredictable world? Research suggests that you will have to demonstrate three specific skills, entrepreneurial acumen, contextual intelligence, and cultural elasticity or soft skills acumen. Permit me to elaborate briefly on each one of these required skills. In the human age, an entrepreneurial mindset is required because certain uncertainty will be the new normal in the world of business and work. Emblematic of the need for an entrepreneurial mindset, research shows that companies are clearly struggling to recruit those with the apparently rare ability to guide them through an unpredictable and competitive external environment. To thrive in the human age, you will have to demonstrate an ability to deal with ambiguity, a willingness to take incalculable risks, and the capability to be tenacious and decisive in responding to unanticipated crises and opportunities. In the human age, success will hinge on your ability to be creative in devising innovative solutions to a company's or society's most pressing problems. It does not matter whether you will aspire to work in the for-profit, not-for-profit, or government sector, an entrepreneurial mindset is a prerequisite for success in the human age. Like the consummate traditional business entrepreneur, if one door closes in your face, you will have to display the entrepreneurial tenacity to cut another door that leads to your or your employer's next economic opportunity. In addition to an entrepreneurial mindset, contextual intelligence will also be highly valued in the human age. Contextual intelligence is defined as an acute sensitivity to the social, political, technological, economic, and demographic drivers of change that will define the future. Having the foresight to anticipate change is another way of defining contextual intelligence. HR professionals often assert that tech talent is the new it, the new capitalism in the human age. But talent isn't just people. It is people with specific skills, behaviors, and ways of operating in a chaotic global environment that fits the needs of an organization. In today's highly volatile global environment, work is not where you go. Rather, it is what you do. In the human age, where we work and what we look like when we work will matter much less than what we can contribute. And what we can contribute will be inextricably linked to our ability to amass contextual intelligence that in turn will give us the foresight to anticipate change and manage ambiguity. Individuals who are masters of contextual intelligence can see around the corner well before they approach it. They can peer through the fog of economic uncertainty and global insecurity and identify unanticipated challenges and opportunities. In the human age, success will hinge less on what you know and more on what you can find. To succeed, you must leverage state-of-the-art technology and the analytical skills you have acquired here at Carolina to mine big data and analyze information from a wide array of sources with an eye toward uncovering heretofore unrecognized patterns and relationships that lead to new scientific discoveries and new and are more effective ways to solve pressing organizational and societal problems. For those of you who aspire to be entrepreneurs, becoming adept at contextual intelligence gathering will help you avoid being blindsided by unanticipated changes 
and disruptive trends that can potentially derail your business. How do you develop personal contextual intelligence? You leverage the power and influence of the internet, the World Wide Web, and the dizzying array of smart technologies and social networking tools you have at your disposal. You type keywords or phrases corresponding to what you view as the future drivers of change in the search engines of your choice, and then specify how often you want to be alerted to the latest developments in those topical areas, and you become a voracious consumer of the contextual intelligence that you uncover. Along with entrepreneurial acumen and contextual intelligence, you will also need cultural elasticity or impeccable soft skills to thrive and prosper in the human age. Soft skills are those intangible attributes, abilities, skills, and traits that pertain to personality, attitude, and behavior rather than formal or technical knowledge. These, these skills include the ability to think critically, reason analytically, solve problems, communicate clearly both orally and in writing, and work in teams that increasingly will transcend international boundaries. For all practical purposes, a borderless workforce will be the norm in the human age. Companies are leveraging communication technology, especially mobile broadband and mobile cellular technologies, and are engaging in labor recruitment via strategic migration domestically and internationally to find the talent they need. As a consequence, work will increasingly take place remotely, vir virtually, and collaboratively. In addition, owing in parts to the economic downturn and increases in longevity, fewer boomers, those of us who were born between 1946 and 1964, are retiring. And some retirees have been forced back into the workforce, dubbed the newly unretired, as the recession wreaked havoc on their retirement portfolios. In the human age, as a consequence of these developments, you will have to demonstrate the ability to interface successfully with associates, collaborators, competitors, and customers or clients who not only are diverse in terms of race and ethnicity, gender, and international origin, but also age-wise, they will span four generations, pre-boomers, boomers, Generation X, and Generation Y, all of whom will bring to the new world of work different core values, communication and interaction styles, work ethics and values, leadership styles and perspectives on feedback and rewards. To compete in a workforce that is both borderless and multi-generational, you will have to demonstrate the ability to code switch. That is to use your cultural elasticity skills to change your behavioral norms depending on the situational context in which you find yourself at any given point in time. Why is the ability to code switch or cultural elasticity an important skill in the hyper-competitive global economy of the 21st century? It is well understood that a diverse, culturally competent workforce improves companies' ability to both innovate and attract and retain diverse clients. But surveys reveal that corporate executives are particularly perturbed by the lack of soft skills in prospective hires, especially the absence of good interpersonal skills. They note that cultural and linguistic misunderstandings internally and with clients and customers are very costly, often resulting in significant financial losses, especially in cross-border transactions. Given the entrepreneurially inspired, innovation-driven, and global education you have received here at Carolina, the crucial remaining question is, how do you market or strategically position yourself for success in the human age? To distinguish yourself, you must develop your own personal brand. Personal branding requires that you cast aside the user descriptions employers depend on to situate prospective hires in their firms or organizations. In developing your personal brand, you must answer the question, what do I do for a living? And you must not frame your answer to this question in terms of job title or function. Instead, you must explain the end result of what you do. In developing your personal brand, you must think differently about yourself. Start by identifying qualities or characteristics that distinguish you from your peers, your most noteworthy traits, your greatest strengths, and what makes you stand out. If you're going to become a brand, you have to focus on what you do that adds value. Personal branding requires that you develop what is referred to as reputational power. You must become known for making significant contributions in some area of expertise. And once you develop your personal brand, you need to devise a strategy for marketing yourself. A personal website is probably your best marketing tool. Your personal website should help the viewer understand how valuable you are and how you can help them get what they want. Starting now, you must view your career as a portfolio of educational experiences and projects through which you acquire new skills, gain new expertise, develop new capabilities, broaden and deepen your networks, and constantly refine your brand. Let me conclude by making the following observation. 
in the human age, continued disruptive change in the global marketplace and the rapid pace of technological change will mean in all likelihood that you will have to constantly reinvent yourself. Given this likely state of affairs, you must therefore develop and maintain a learning mindset to ensure that you continue to expand or broaden your human potential, hone your cultural competencies, refine your communication skills, and leverage your contextual intelligence and entrepreneurial acumen throughout your career. Our national competitiveness in the global marketplace rests on your dogged tenacity in each of these domains. Embracing a learning mindset, I believe, will enable you to respond sensitively, nimbly, and quickly to both the challenges and opportunities that are likely to characterize our lives in the new world of work in the years ahead. Foremost among the payoffs, it will ensure that you are able to compete successfully for employment and self-employments in the highly volatile and unpredictable global economy of the 21st century. Thank you for your indulgence this afternoon. I wish you the very best as you continue to pursue your educational career goals and aspirations. Thank you, Professor Johnson. You can wait until after the ceremony before you start going home to build your website. <laughs> it's now my privilege to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School, Dr. Steve Matson, who will present the candidates for the doctoral degree. Carolina's doctoral students are the next generation of great leaders, educators, and healthcare providers. Their work is at the heart of our research programs and they're responsible for some of the most exciting innovations taking place on and across our campus and across the state and the nation. Every day they are teaching, they're caring for patients, and they're serving in so many ways in our community. We're very, very proud of their extraordinary contributions. Will the candidates for the degrees of Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Public Health, and Doctor of Education, please rise to be conducted forward by Faculty Marshal Valerie Ashby. Susan Kaplow, PhD in Ecology. Yaru Lee, PhD in Environmental Sciences and Engineering. Valerie Adada Parker, Doctor of Nursing Practice in Nursing. Nick Mosca, DRPH, Health Policy and Management. Franklin Uba, PhD, Chemistry. Nicole Gabrielle Griffin, PhD, Genetics and Molecular Biology. Myra Grace de la Pena, PhD, Microbiology and Immunology. Breonna Hare, PhD, Epidemiology. Aziz Shaber, PhD, Linguistics. Melanie Alazam, PhD, Oral Biology. Courtney Cox, PhD, Biology. Abel Valdivia, PhD, Biology. Heather Boykin, DNP, Nursing. Connor Harrison, PhD, Geography. Lisa Huggins Oxendine, DRPH, Public Health Executive Leadership. Rosa Ibanez, PhD, Romance Languages. Juan Joe, PhD, Economics. 
Allison Turner, PhD Education. Kobe Leeper, PhD Nursing. Isla Broyles, PhD, Health Policy and Management. Laura Jackson, PhD, Economics. Luciana Leopold, PhD, Genetics and Molecular Biology. Brian Bauer, PhD, Genetics and Molecular Biology. Jason Carter, PhD, Computer Science. Laura Nesser, PhD, Geological Sciences. Cheryl Roberts, PhD, Sociology. Cynthia Brand, EDD, Curriculum and Instruction. Emily Gidcom, PhD, Material Science. Richard Watkins, PhD, Microbiology and Immunology. Jennifer Colzer, PhD, Genetics and Molecular Biology. Thank you, Dean Matson. Please join me once again in recognizing the achievements of our doctoral candidates. <laughs> we next turn to the conferral of the master's, the professional, and the bachelor's degrees. I'd like to take a moment first to recognize some of our outstanding undergraduates. These seniors, are exceptionally accomplished students who exemplify the highest possible level of undergraduate scholarship. Not only have they been active in every aspect of our campus life, these students have been leaders in every single class that they took. Will the candidates for the baccalaureate degrees with highest honors please stand and remain standing? Thank you. <laughs> Stay standing. We'd like to ask the candidates for the baccalaureate degrees with honors to please rise and remain standing. Congratulations to all of you. I now call upon the deans of the university in order of the anniversary date of each college or school who have candidates here today to present their candidates for doctoral, master's, and baccalaureate degrees. Will Dean Karen Gill please come forward to present the students from the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> Chancellor Fault, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Arts, Master of Art in Fine Arts, Master of City and Regional Planning, Master of Science, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Music, and Bachelor of Science. Will these students please rise? Most of you. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Will Dean Jack Boger please come forward to present the students from the School of Law. Chancellor Fultz, I'm pleased to present to you the candidates for Juris Doctor and Master of Laws. Will these students please rise? Will Vice Dean Julie Byerly please come forward to present the students from the School of Medicine.
Chancellor Fold, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Audiology, Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Physical Therapy, Master of Science, Bachelor of Science in Clinical Laboratory Science, and Bachelor of Science in Radiologic Science. Will those students please stand? Thank you. Will Dean Bill McDiarmid please come forward to present the students from the School of Education. Chancellor Folt, I'm pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Education, Master of Arts, Master of Arts in Teaching, Master of Education, Master of School Administration, and Bachelor of Arts in Education. Would these candidates please rise? Thank you. Will Associate Dean Darren Thacker please come forward to present students from the Eshelman School of Pharmacy. Chancellor Ford, I'm pleased to present to you the candidates for the Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Pharmacy, Master of Science, and Bachelor of Science in Pharmaceutical Sciences. Will these students please rise? Will Dean Doug Shackelford please come forward to present students from the Keenan Flagler Business School. Chancellor Fault, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Accounting, Master of Business Administration, and Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. Will these students please rise? Will Dean Jack Richmond please come forward to present the students from the School of Social Work. Chancellor Folt, I am pleased and proud to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy and Master's Degree in Social Work. Will these students please rise? Will Senior Associate Dean Heidi Hennick Kaminsky, please come forward to present the students from the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Chancellor Fold, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Arts, and Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Mass Communication. Will these students please rise? Thank you. Will Dean Gary Marcinini please come forward to present the students from the School of Information and Library Science. Chancellor Folt, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Master of Science in Information Science, Master of Science in Library Science, and Bachelor of Science in Information Science. Will these students please rise? Will Dean Barbara Reimer please come forward to present the students from the Gilling School of Global Public Health. Chancellor Fault, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Public Health, Master of Healthcare Administration, Master of Public Health, Master of Science, Master of Sciences in Environmental Sciences and Engineering, Master of Science in Public Health, and Bachelor of Science in Public Health. Will these students please rise? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Will Dean Jane Weintraub please come forward to present the students from the School of Dentistry.
Chancellor Falk, I am pleased to present to you the candidate for Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Dental Surgery, Master of Science, and Bachelor of Science in Dental Hygiene. Will these students please rise? Thank you. Will Interim Dean Donna Havens please come forward to present the students from the School of Nursing. Chancellor Folk, I am pleased to present to you the candidates for Doctor of Philosophy, Doctor of Nursing Practice, Master of Science in Nursing, and Bachelor of Science in Nursing. Will these students please rise? Will all the degree candidates please rise? <laughs> Drum roll, here it comes. <laughs> By virtue of the authority vested in the University of North Carolina, by the state of North Carolina, and by the university entrusted to me, I hereby confer upon you the degree for which the faculty has certified you, together with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining, effective December 31st, 2014. And I offer you my warmest congratulations. I now, call, I now call upon Alexis White, the Vice President of the Senior Class, to come forward and lead you in the switching of your tassel, signifying your graduation from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. As the Senior Class Vice President of the Classes of 2014 and 2015, I am honored to lead you in the moving of your tassels from right to left, signifying your new status. Congratulations, graduates. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> We're almost finished. <laughs> I have a graduation ritual myself. On the morning of graduation, I usually take a moment to walk across campus and to savor in the beautiful quiet and beauty of the morning's light on campus, the waking of the day here. It helps me to imagine what I think all of you might be feeling. And it reminds me of the countless times each of you has walked these paths, alone or with friends, in conversation or in thought, on your way to your classes and on the way to your activities. This morning, I was reminded of the TEDx UNC conference called Taking Flight that was organized by our students, some of you may be sitting, graduating here today, last spring. And I decided to share with you an experience in my life as a biologist that I shared at that conference. It was a moment when I was crouched on a high rocky cliff that looked out over a spectacular beach and to what looked to be an endless sea at the southernmost tip of New Zealand. I was there concealed behind a hideaway to witness one of nature's greatest marvels, the flight of a newly fledged giant albatross. Just a few feet away, 
I watched one of the world's largest seabirds with a wingspan of nearly 12 feet run forward awkwardly, <laughs> leap off a cliff, catch the currents of the wind, and soar far out over the sea to begin a year-long journey over water where it would not touch down on land. It was unforgettable. It was this biologist's dream. And that's how I see all of you today, taking your next leap into the unknown. I want you to feel how large your wings have actually become in the time that you're here. I can only think about the experiences and what it feels to have that exuberance of flight. And I can only begin to imagine the new perspectives you're going to gain, the sights and experiences you're going to have. My advice is explore, take chances, believe in your own courage, never risk your integrity, and never lose your compassion. Remember to be thankful, and when you draw from those wells of strength, you're going to find your meaning and your purpose. You have received opportunities here that very few people will ever receive, and you've been supported by the hard-earned dollars of North Carolinians from all walks of life and from alumni across the globe who believe in your future, in our university's public mission, and are committed to making opportunity available to all people. And we expect much of you. Discoveries, new industries, important questions to be answered, social problems of great magnitude that need your attention. And in turn, we promise back to you that this will be forever your home and that we will continue to make Carolina a place of pride, promise, and a place always for the people. So before we close, I'd like to follow one last Carolina tradition and ask all the families and friends who are visiting us to please rise, parents, spouses, children, grandparents, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, neighbors, <laughs> clergy, <laughs> And more. Graduates, this is your job now is to fill this auditorium with your applause for all these wonderful people. A little louder. Thank you for sharing them with us during their time here at Carolina. Now let's also thank director of the university band, Jeffrey Fuchs, and the band, your fellow student musicians for their music today. I'd like to thank our student marshals for their work, the Carolina staff who make this stadium look so beautiful for the event today, staying overnight to get this ready. So we thank all of them. Thank you. And now I'm going to call on the incredibly talented Evan Adair to join us again in leading us in singing Hark the Sound. At the conclusion of the alma mater, the senior class marshals will lead the recessional of the faculty and the degree candidates. So we ask you to remain in place until the recessional is completed. And thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays. And now let's all stand as we sing Hark the Sound. Oh, 